Welcome to all of you. And speaking of worth waiting for, Ava, very nice to have you back. Thanks. Grateful you're doing better. So thank the Lord. But welcome to all of you who have gathered together to worship the Lord this morning. If you're visiting with us, welcome to you also. Or if you're worshiping online, uh, grateful that you've tuned in to hear God's word this morning. Let me give you the announcements and then I'll read the opening scripture. We do have our joint meeting today for our elders and deacons, and we can just all meet together at 5. So elders, normally we would gather at 4.30, but some of our business can wait until more of us can be there. So 5 o'clock if you're coming today, uh, and we will meet together with the deacons for the joint meeting this afternoon. Also, our youth group will resume next Lord's Day evening, so if you normally Come for that. We will have worship here in the sanctuary at 6, and then the youth meetings will resume next Sunday evening. If you haven't brought your baby bottle back for CPC, just drop that off tonight uh, when you come. I will run those over this week. Also, for the women in the church, we did give a gift card to Mary Gamble's family in the wake of her passing. And so Kathleen Lindsay is collecting $5 to recuperate that. You can give that to her next time you see her. And then next Lord's Day, be in prayer and be in preparation. We will observe the Lord's table during our morning worship. So it'll be a blessed time together as we meet with our God around the Lord's table. All right. See no other announcements? Then let's look at the front of our bulletin. Let me read this text together from Psalm 50. Psalm 50, very much a paradigm for what we do when we meet to worship, as it summons God's people together to hear God speak. That is worship, and that is what we do this morning. So come, let us worship the Lord. The mighty one God, the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to where it sets. From Zion, perfect in beauty, God shines forth. Our God comes and will not be silent. A fire devours before him, and around him a tempest rages. He summons the heavens above and the earth, that he may judge his people. Gather to me this consecrated people, who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. And the heavens proclaim his righteousness, for he is a God of justice. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we do... Assemble ourselves together in your presence. You have called us to worship. And so we gather and we respond by calling on your name. In a moment, you will speak to us as we read your word and we listen. God is glorified and proclaimed in the reading and preaching of the word. So may you be magnified today. May we make much of Christ through the ministry of the word and grant that we will hear and give you the glory the right response that you deserve again you are a glorious god perfect in beauty and you shine forth you come and speak to your people you are on one level terrifying and awesome in your dread a fire devours before you and around you a tempest rages you're a god of justice and righteousness and compared to that Lord, who can stand? If you kept a record of sins, we wouldn't be able to remain in your presence. Thank you, God, that with you there is forgiveness. And so on another level, you are a God who invites us into your presence. And one and the same God, righteous and holy and forgiving and merciful, you, you call us to come before you. We approach you because there's been a sacrifice made, the remission of sins through Jesus Christ our Lord. So we gather in your presence and we long to hear your voice. We pray you would forgive us of our sins and that you would give us the grace we so desperately need this morning. So continue with us throughout this time and be glorified. We call on you because you are our Father. You are in heaven. So hallowed be thy name. Let thy kingdom come. Let thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. 
Turn with me, please, this morning to Psalm 2, the Old Testament Scripture, Psalm 2, as we continue to look through this book, looking at selected psalms this morning. So psalm 2 is to be our psalm this morning. Again, we'll look selectively at the psalms, but we will look at Psalm 2 today and then Psalm 3 next week, and then we'll begin to jump forward throughout the book. Psalm 2 is our focus this morning. Now, as you're turning there, before I read the text, I do want to pray again. I want to pray for the needs of our congregation and pray for God to bless the reading and the preaching of his word. One prayer request you can be mindful of is our brother Tom Lindsay broke his arm earlier this week, uh, fell off a ladder, doesn't think it's a major a break, so hopefully he should be able to recover well and quickly, but be in prayer for him. He said, I'm glad I didn't fall on my head. That would have probably broke the pavement, so <laughs> Tom's doing okay. He's still very much Tom, and uh, we'll pray that he recovers quickly. It's probably some pain, obviously, interruption to his work, so be in prayer. Let's go before the Lord. Father in heaven, again, we recognize that you are God. You are the great shepherd of the sheep. And so I pray that you would care for your flock this morning. I pray especially for our brother Tom Lindsay, that he would heal quickly, that his break would not be major, and that indeed he could uh, recover soon with, with minimal pain and return to work. I pray that you would comfort him in this time, help him to feel useful, to use the time where he may be more limited to commune with you and fellowship with you and to know your grace, to provide for him and to meet his needs. Continue to be with him and Kathleen. Father, we do thank you for the care you show for our congregation. We thank you that Ava is back with us today. And the other folks that either are sick or have been sick, you care for them. You take care of them. You carry us through. Even in your wisdom and calling your servant Mary to be with you, that you give grace to your congregation. And you do all things well. And we would bow before that God in your reign. We do pray you'd be merciful. Spare us of uh, further great sickness or even death. Bring us through uh, this time. Help us to wait upon you. But be pleased to show mercy and to bring us out of this time. I do pray we'd profit from it in terms of giving thought to the shortness of life or what ultimately matters in life. That we are in your kingdom and serving you. pray we would learn those lessons use this time well. Learn to depend on you and to be content and joyful in you and not just the things you give us. So continue to care for our congregation, for David Hislop and others, and thank you that you are faithful. And we would pray for the work of the ministry here and abroad. So we think of David and Robin White caring for missionaries throughout the world, part of that global support that we try to give to our missionaries, give them wisdom to know how they can Use their time and serve you well and encourage others and equip others during this time. Pray for Sammy Rhodes at USC, whatever ministry there might look like. That you'd give him wisdom and that there would be good fruit for the glory of God. Pray for Dan Coleman at the Providence Church. You'd bless him in the ministry there and continue to build it up. May it increase. May he know your grace. And for CEF, again, the, the Good News Club over at Roebuck School at Again, not able to meet in person. So what, what can they do? How can they best serve you? Thank you that they're working on that. And they are giving some alternative instructions. So I pray it would go well and that you would bless for your glory. And so now as we look at your word, as we uh, bring ourselves before and under the scriptures, speak to us, help us to yield in faith and obedience to know the glory and grace and help of God. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Psalm 2, why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. I will proclaim the Lord's decree. 
He said to me, You are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask me, and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will break them with a rod of iron. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling. Kiss his son, or he will be angry, and your way will lead to your destruction. For his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Amen for God's word. In 2001, Peter Jackson released the first movie in his Lord of the Rings trilogy entitled The Fellowship of the Ring. I was about halfway through college when it came out. I'd actually, at that point, never heard of the Lord of the Rings books. I only went to the film, in fact, because some friends invited me and I wanted to go and do something when I had seen the previews previously. I wasn't interested at all. I thought, I thought it looked like something not that I would enjoy in the least. But as I sat through the first film, I really got into it. And by the time the movie reached the end, I, I was ready to see how will Frodo get this ring to Mount Doom. Well, imagine my surprise then when the screen went black and the credits began to roll without Frodo and Sam even entering Mordor. I actually sat up in the theater and said out loud, what? And the people with me started to laugh. They said, do you not know there are three films and books? And I said, no, I had no idea. I really wanted to know how the story ended, but at that point, I didn't have all of the story. There was more to come. Well, last week, we began looking at the specific Psalms in the book of Psalms. We focused on Psalm 1, which provides an introduction to the Psalter. It's kind of your way into the book as a whole. And it argues if you want to live the good life, then follow or submit to God's word. However, as good as that message is, as foundational as that message is, it is not the whole story. There is more to come. If you want to live the Christian life while you're waiting for your king to return, well, you must submit to God's word. But there's actually more to the Christian life than submitting to God's word. There is another submission we must make. And Psalm 2 will tell us what that is. Now, the proof for that, the reason I'm taking Psalms 1 and 2 together as the introduction to the whole, it comes at the end of Psalm 2. The very last line of verse 12 reads, Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Notice again that word, blessed. Last week, we spent a lot of time talking about that word, blessed. It begins Psalm 1. It's the very first word of the Psalter. And we argued it talks about those who live in an enviable position. The blessed person is someone living the good life as God defines it. Who are those who, li who live the good life? Who wants to be in the right position? It's those who submit to God's word. Well, notice here in Psalm 2, the same word concludes the psalm. And that is an intentional clue that both psalms go together. That together they describe the fundamental qualities, the foundational qualities of those who live the good life. And so who are those, according to Psalm 2, who live the good life? Those who submit to God's Son. So I want us to consider from Psalm 2, if you want to live the good life, then submit to God's Son. And the psalm will build to that conclusion through four steps. We'll present them in terms of four questions. So the first question is, who needs to submit? Who, who does this psalm for? Who needs this psalm? To whom is it speaking? Well, it opens with a question. 
Why do the nations conspire? The old King James. Why do the heathen rage? And the peoples plot in vain. Now the nations and the people here, this refers to the inhabitants of the earth. So the psalm is speaking to you and me. It's going to go on and talk about rulers. But don't think that it shifts the attention just to those who are in charge. The rulers often represent the people. So the psalm speaks to the inhabitants of the earth. The author of the psalm, he looks at humanity and he describes us as rebellious. He says we are plotting, we are conspiring, planning some kind of revolution. Well, against what or whom are we rebelling? Verses 2 to 3 answer that question. The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord. And against his anointed, saying, let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. In short, we are rebelling against the Lord. The faithful, covenant-keeping God who reigns from heaven. Our rebellion is ultimately directed against him. Whether we're conscious of it or not, that is where our rebellion is ultimately aimed. We are also rebelling against his anointed king or messiah and he'll come up in the next section of the psalm the inhabitants of the earth are depicted as unfaithful unwilling to submit to god's reign now why do we want to rebel against god well according to verse three the inhabitants of the earth view the reign of god as a form of slavery and imprisonment. Notice it uses the language of chains and shackles. So humans naturally view God's reign as restrictive. It's a form of slavery or a form of imprisonment. And we need to be emancipated. We need to be set free, liberated from this slavery. It's restrictive. It's stifling. And by the way, since the end of the psalm talks about making peace with the Son... And submitting to him, I think we can say even more specifically, humans view God's commands as restrictive and stifling. So it's not so much that we're rebelling against his providence, you know, the way he runs the world. That's an application. We'll, we'll make that in a moment. But the most specific focus here is humans naturally resist God's commands. And we want to shake them off in order to be truly free. Now, that has been Satan's strategy from the beginning, hasn't it? He told Eve there in the garden, God's ways are too restrictive. God knows, this is the Genesis 3, 5, God knows that when you eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Satan depicts God as afraid. Uh, the humans may obtain something that God has, and so he's got to cruelly restrict it. He can't let humans get what he has. So Satan views God as overly restrictive, jealous, petty, doesn't want you to live the good life his way. A New Testament example could be the rich young ruler. When he comes to Jesus for eternal life, Jesus tells him, if you want to be perfect, go, sell your possessions, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. But the rich young ruler goes away sad. Why? Because he loves his wealth. The commandment is asking too much. It's too restrictive. It's too oppressive. It can't be done. Now, here's the question we have to ask ourselves this morning. Who views God's commandments this way? I think when we read this psalm, especially since it uses the language of the nations conspiring, I think we are tempted to think that other people view God's commands this way. Maybe you think your political opponents view God's commands this way. Maybe you think your cultural icons, who don't uphold perhaps uh, traditional stances on morality, they're the ones this psalm is talking about. Maybe it's those irresponsible churches that don't preach the Bible and compromise on important issues. It's easy to go that way when we read the psalm, but if we're being honest with ourselves, 
We have to confess that everyone, including ourselves, beginning with ourselves, view God's commands this way. In the well-known Romans 3, Paul writes, There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. And Paul, by the way, goes on and quotes several psalms right after that statement to prove that before God, every mouth is silenced. No one will be declared righteous in God's sight. By nature, our natural state, we are all sinners condemned by God's law. And this is why Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. My point here is before we see someone else's sin, we need to be quick to see our own. It doesn't mean there isn't a place for prophetic preaching that names the sins of the day and those who are responsible for them and warns against God's judgment. There is absolutely a place for that. But ordinarily, the preaching of the word for the people assembled in this room, we are to ask ourselves first and foremost, how does this apply to me? Now, the good news of the gospel is that God does not leave us in this state. So what did we see last week from Psalm 1? Blessed are those whose delight is in the law of the Lord. So we may come forth naturally opposed to God's word. We may naturally view it as restrictive. And yet at the same time, it is possible to find joy in keeping God's commands. How? What makes the difference? The work of the Spirit of God. The one who makes us willing and able to keep God's law. Ezekiel 11 promises, I will give them an undivided heart and put a new spirit in them. I will remove from them their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. Then they will follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. They will be my people and I will be their God. So ask yourself this morning, have you had this heart change in your life? I'm not asking if you're perfect. You, even after you undergo that heart change, you're still going to find some corruption in you that just comes bubbling up to the surface in moments of temptation or even at certain times that perhaps you're being pressed to consider God's commands. We'll have to wrestle with that. But we will also find within us a true delight that views God's commandments as good as something that we want to keep, as the good life in which you walk, in which you want to walk, because that is the way to enjoy life. That's a good test, by the way, for preaching that gets the interpretation of God's word right and is accompanied by the Spirit of God. When we hear things that are on one level offensive or maybe we don't want to do, the Spirit of God tunes our ears. We hear them in such a way we want to follow God. That's the good way. We don't feel crushed and defeated when we have the Spirit because we know He will enable us to walk in God's way. So before we think about how other people perhaps could benefit from the psalm, let's take the honest look at ourselves. Is there an area in my heart in which I am resisting God's commands? Are there areas in which I need to submit to God's Son? That then leads to the second question. Why do we need? to submit to God's Son? Or why should we submit to God's Son? And I'll answer this question up front. We need to submit to the Son because we cannot resist His reign. Verses 4 to 6 read, The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in His anger and terrifies them in His wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. When I remember as a very young Christian, somebody once asked, does God ever laugh? Well, when he sees the rebellion of the nations, he laughs. In fact, the text says that he scoffs at them. 
One translation, therefore, renders this as he laughs in disgust because he's looking at the rebellion and he is scoffing at it. By the way, friends, he's not intimidated by it. He's not wringing his hands in heaven and upset and disturbed. He's not intimidated by this opposition. He will defend his kingdom against any and all such assaults. In fact, the first section of the psalm prepares us for this response. Notice again how the psalm opens. Why do the nations conspire? The psalmist isn't scratching his head trying to figure out, oh, I wonder why the nations are rebelling against God. No, he's astonished that anyone would even try. Why are you doing that? Don't you know that's doomed to fail? In fact, the second line of verse 1, the people's plot in vain. Their conspiracies are doomed to fail before they even launch. Now, why are such rebellions doomed to fail? Well, not only because you can't fight God, Verse 6 is even more specific. I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. Such rebellions are doomed because God has appointed a king through whom he will rule the world. So God is the king, and yet he will bring his reign from heaven to earth. And he will do so by means of a king, a human king, whom verse 7 identifies as God's son. Now, how does this all work together? Well, what we're dealing with here is the theme of kingship. And this is a theme that runs throughout the entire Bible and culminates in Jesus Christ. Here's the basic sketch. When God created Adam and Eve, he told them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. You hear in that verse the language of dominion, submission, ruling and reigning. Adam and Eve were intended to be the rulers of God's creation. That's part of what it means to bear his image, to exercise dominion, to represent God's rule. Of course, like what we read in the opening verses of Psalm 2, the rulers chose to rebel. So God enters later into a covenant with Israel, and he tells them, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Israel will now represent God's rule in the world. Later, more specifically to David, God says, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, and I will establish his kingdom. I will be his father, and he will be my son. So David and his descendants will be the kings who will represent God's rule in the world. Sadly, again, though, so many of Israel's kings failed in this regard. In fact, they did a lot to degrade Israel's faith. And so that is why then the prophets look forward to a coming king. Someone who will be different from all the other kings who will rule in righteousness and bring in God's kingdom. And in the Gospels, here comes Jesus preaching the kingdom of God identifying himself as God's son, as the king who will fulfill this psalm. And once again, the rulers rebel. The people who are supposed to be the solution become the problem. And Christ is crucified on Calvary. So it's really a bleak picture on one hand, isn't it? Why then would we say that rebellion against God's king is doomed to fail? Listen to these words. From Acts 4, Peter praying says, You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. There's Peter praying Psalm 2. So here's Peter's commentary in the prayer. Indeed. Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles 
and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed. But they did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. After the resurrection of Jesus, the apostles realize in full clarity, Jesus is the promised king of Psalm 2. And yes, the nations conspired against him. They rejected him and they succeeded in killing him. But you know what? That was what God intended all along. And now God has raised him from the dead and is working powerful miracles through his name. So you cannot resist the reign of God even when evil happens. So maybe you struggle to think that God is in charge because of all the evil in the world. You look at the world and think there cannot be a good God because things are so bad. It's interesting that in the verses from Acts, they place even the crucifixion of Christ, a great act of injustice and wickedness under the sovereign control of God. We may not always understand why God governs his world the way he does, but you would be wise. In fact, better yet, you'd be safe to submit to that reign. Now, what that also means is we will never be blessed. We will never be happy. We will never be holy until we believe that God really is in charge of this world. So as I said a moment ago, I want to encourage you. Keep the focus of the psalm on yourself. Look to see how we could submit better. But at the same time, I understand the distress that comes from looking at wicked rulers and wondering why God allows such wickedness to continue. That is a struggle that God's people throughout the ages face. So think how Israel might have read this psalm during the time of the exile. When there was no Davidic king on the throne, where they were under the authority of other nations, how would they have read this psalm? It would have directed their eyes towards heaven. It would have directed their eyes towards God's ultimate throne. It would have directed their eyes to the future when a king would come. And it wouldn't do that in a way that was escapist. It would do that in a way that would give them stability and the ability to serve God in the present and ultimately to seek his kingdom. And we would be, well, wise. We would do well to do that also. So here's the third question. How does God bring about his reign? In verses 7 to 9, we hear this anointed king speak. He tells us what God said to him. He said, you are my son. Today I have become your father and ask me, and I will make the nations your inheritance. Now follow this. Here God promises the king worldwide dominion. The son will have worldwide dominion. Now maybe you wonder about the language, today I have become your father. Does that mean there was a point when Jesus was not God's son? And so God adopted him at some point? In the original context, here's what the language means. The ancient Near Eastern kings would use this language when they spoke to a faithful subject and elevated him to a special status, to a position of rulership. So here's my point. The scriptures here aren't describing the relationship between father and son. They're not talking about when the son became the son. They are referring to the fact that God appointed his son to be king. In other words, it is the father who has designated that the son will rule. And we find the psalm, by the way, applied to Jesus at his baptism, on the Mount of Transfiguration, and after his resurrection. Pointing to the fact that throughout his ministry, this promise was progressively realized until he rose from the dead and he was installed definitively as king over his creation. So how then does Jesus manifest his reign? Well, verse 9 says, You will break them, the nations, with a rod of iron. Friend, essentially, if you do not submit to King Jesus, he will judge you. He will smash you. 
He will break you as easily as an iron rod smashes pottery. This is God's world. And according to the opening verses, we are the rebels. We are the trespassers. We are the invaders. And God will defend his world against such intruders. If we do not submit to God's Son, judgment comes. But there is a second way in which this reign manifests itself. And it's hinted at by the little phrase, I will make the nations your inheritance. With that phrase in your ear, listen to what Jesus said right before he ascended into heaven. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Jesus is the king of Psalm 2. He has all authority. So how does he subdue the nations? By making the nations his disciples. By saving them. The similarity in language there of Psalm 2 and Matthew 28, that's not an accident. Saving the nations is one of the ways God's reign comes about. And that's why the psalm concludes with the invitation, kiss the son, serve the Lord. There is a benevolent way, a good way to experience the reign of God. It comes to those who submit to God's son. God's enemies can become his loving subjects. So let's conclude by that, looking at that invitation Fourth question, how do we submit to God's Son? Well, verses 10 to 12 don't require much explanation. Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling. Kiss his son or he will be angry and your way will lead to your destruction for his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. How do you submit to God's Son? Lay down your weapons and surrender to his reign. Make peace with him. Kiss the Son. Make peace with this Son. And you do that by repenting of your sins and trusting in Christ alone for forgiveness. You take refuge in him. You hide yourself in him from his wrath. As the, great, as the late great R.C. Sproul once said, the grand paradox or supreme irony of the Christian faith is that we are saved both by God and from God. So don't fool yourself. You cannot think that you are safe with God when you do not serve him. So maybe you don't claim to serve him. Today's the day to, to serve him. Maybe you claim to be on his side, but you don't serve him. That doesn't work. You cannot be on his side without serving him. Do you submit to his rule with both joy and trembling, with reverence and respect and love? Maybe on the other hand, you fear you don't serve God well enough. Like, I want to be on his side, but I'm such a poor servant. Perhaps in the end, he will reject me. Remember when you were still a rebel, that's when Christ died for you. So is your heart inclined towards him? Do you move towards serving him? Then he receives you. And the wonder of the whole story, of course, is that while we, while we are the rebels, it is Jesus the king who becomes a servant and a victim and is killed by the rebels. But that's how God brings about his reign. He rises to victory. He shows that submission to him is indeed the way to life. He is reigning today, restraining the nations. He is reigning today, saving the nations. So take hope in that. And if you want to enjoy this good life, then submit to God's son. So let's pray and give thanks together. Father in heaven, and Lord Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, we come before you having heard your word and we repent of the ways we rebel against God. Forgive us when we view 
your commandments. Not human traditions or the misinterpretation of God's commands, but the pure, true word of God. Forgive us when we view that as restrictive or a, a poor way to walk, or when we rebel against it, when we do not submit to your commands. Forgive us of that, we pray. And make us by your spirit more submissive to your will. Help us to delight in obeying God's commands. And we pray this morning, Lord, I pray, we pray, bring the nations to submission. May we see common grace, if nothing else, restraining wickedness, but we especially long to see your special grace saving the nations. So make this church, make Roebuck Church a healthy, strong church. Thank you for the abundance of ways you have blessed it. Bless the work of Calvary Presbytery and the PCA and the kingdom of God here in Roebuck and Spartanburg County and beyond. May your kingdom grow and expand. May more be brought into it, and may we yield ourselves to it in delight more and more each day. And we ask these things in the mighty, beautiful name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you.